tonight we're going to get right into it. Um, I have been uh, tasked by Pastor Russ to talk to you about one of the overcomers in the Old Testament named Job. Named Job, that's right. So we're going to talk about him, but let's go ahead and jump to our passage, and I'll pray after we read God's Word. So if you want to turn on or open your Bibles or just watch, look at the screen, I'm going right to the end, the conclusion of Job, 42 chapters, and it's Job's response to God's interaction with him uh, when God comes in the finale in the, in the grand conclusion. Starting in uh, verse 1, Job 42, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak and I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is God's word. Would you bow with me? Gracious Father, we plead with you tonight that you'd come be with us. Holy Spirit, we invite you here. We turn over our mind, will, and emotions to you. Lord, I ask even in an audacious way that you would shut my mouth, stop my mind if it's something that you're not pleased with or something that's untrue. Um, we ask your guidance on the, under, on the other end of this, God. I ask that you illuminate this text to us. We are here for you, that you would come alongside us and bring us to where we need to be. Give us supernatural focus, remembrance, imagination, reflection. And now may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you're our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. If you live long enough, you're going to suffer. Uh, hence the theme of Job. Uh, you might contract a uh, disease like cancer or get Alzheimer's. Um, you'll, you might get hit by a car in and out of a vehicle, perhaps. Uh, you might pass on in your sleep. You, you just might have something happen to you that you haven't foreseen or haven't desired. But one thing we know for sure, suffering is inevitable. It's inevitable, this side of eternity. The types of suffering are extraordinarily diverse in our world. They're not, uh, you, can get, you can catch diseases like meningitis, babies can get spina fibida, AIDS, HIV, MS, Huntington's cholera, uh, cholera, we'll talk about that a little bit later. There are all sorts of ways, if you ever think about it, even if you don't live very long, you're probably going to bring suffering into the lives of other people that are trying to extend your life. If you're struggling to live up to what we would call an average age or a normal age for a mature human being. Again, if you think about it, there are other ways you can go as well. God forbid we might have something like get stolen from, looted, beaten, tortured, all sorts of different ways. Even just the encroaching age as we decay, decrepitude, from the delirium and the despair of dementia to something like cancer, it could hit any of us and has hit some of us. What I want you to remember in the background here that is connected to the entire book of Job, all 42 chapters, is this. Every worldview or philosophy in life needs to answer the question of suffering. Every single one, whether you have a life philosophy, everybody has one of those, a worldview or religion, has to answer this question. And it's important to understand that there are non-believers that say the religion that you call true, that you follow, has answers that are unmatched that have power in the answers that are unmatched. And this is where I wanted to begin with us tonight. As a matter of fact, one of the more recent scholars that said this very thing is a gentleman named Ron Rickers. Uh, Ron Rickers wrote a book called The Reformation of Suffering. And he said, you know, we historians wonder all the time about how in the world Christianity made it through the first 300 years of suffering, hardship, persecution, being chased around so they had to meet sometimes in catacombs. And he said it largely has to do with how they reframed suffering, how they saw suffering through the lens of the Old and the New Testament. This has been reconfirmed over and over again, even by people that don't share our convictions. And if you think about it, the Bible has this very thing in, in mind as well. The theme of suffering is all throughout the Word of God. You start in Genesis, you get to see where human death comes in, where evil has its genesis. 
Then you get all the way through God's covenant people and the suffering they're under, culminating in a very peaceful negotiation with the superpower of the time, Egypt. Then you get to Exodus. They get delivered from suffering and then bring some suffering on themselves in the wilderness. Then you get the judges. Then you get the monarchy and all sorts of suffering and deliverance that goes on there. Then you get Solomon and you get what? The oppression, right? You get a, a carousel of superpowers in the world that come and oppress the people of Israel. And God is God through all of it. You have the minor prophets and the major prophets. You have prophets like Jeremiah and Habakkuk that give searing, searing expression to the idea that, God, this looks unjust. Habakkuk can't seem to get over the fact that, why is it God's using a more wicked culture to punish our culture? I get it, we're covenant breakers. If you get to the wisdom literature, this would be Proverbs and Psalms, Ecclesiastes. You get to the Proverbs and you think, well, this is interesting. It looks like it's a cause and effect relationship. Bad behavior gets suffering. Good behavior, righteousness gets blessing. And then the other books around it blow that up, like Ecclesiastes, Job, Lamentations, the Psalms. Did you know 50 of the 150 Psalms, the song and hymn book and prayer book of Jesus and every Bible hero, the Psalms, a third of them are filled with lament, disappointment, suffering, and hardship. Prayers, songs to God in this way. If you get to the New Testament, you take the book of Hebrews. The majority of the book of Hebrews is to help Christians suffer well. First Peter's all about what the Christians are going through at that moment. You get to Revelation in John's vision. There are souls near the throne of God saying, How long, O Lord, pleading with God to do something in heaven? And then you get Jesus, the culmination of all, all, all the books, all these books, the entire Bible. Isaiah calls him what? A man of sorrows. So you have this very, very wide perspective looking at us all the way across the Bible and culminating in Jesus. When we give this a look and start looking at it, we can look at the book of Job. You can't get by the book of Job. It's where this thing crystallizes, and it's an extremely difficult book. But before we get there in this intro, I just wanted you to think for a little bit about some things. Here's a, a truth that may be a hard truth and we don't hear very often, but I think it's borne out in the Scriptures, and it's certainly borne out in the book of Job. A lot of us have doctrinal truths in our minds. They're in our minds, but they have a hard time traveling from here to your heart, don't they? The, to go from here, I understand and know it, to trust, let's be honest, usually takes affliction and hardship, doesn't it? It is an efficient but cruel taskmaster suffering. But that's what it takes for a lot of us to really get it. To go from head to heart usually requires risk, disappointment, hardship, or affliction. In God's Word, we see over and over again these issues back and forth about suffering, and they get crystallized in Job. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, rival faiths that's making a kind of a surge here in post-Christian America is Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism has its own particular answer to the problem of suffering. It's just unplug from life. Uh, stop desiring things and you won't be disappointed when you don't get them. That's not the biblical answer. It's pretty interesting. It's, it's really not original. The Stoics thought this around the time of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. The Buddha is just a name for enlightened one. But Buddhism is a mess. Uh, their entire structure, the way they understand good and evil doesn't make any sense. The way they, they diagnose what you should do and give the prognosis they give you, just detach. And then the future, somehow your destiny is determined by the good and evil that you shouldn't care about and detach from. Uh, you get the karmic doctrine as well. But interestingly, that karmic doctrine in Buddhism is somewhat connected to the book of Job. There are two answers that are pat answers to the problem of suffering in our world. One's a non-believing answer, and one's sometimes a believing answer that has a connection to Buddhism. And here's the one believer's answer. Whatever you're going through must be because you did something wrong. And it must be because you've done something wrong. Echoing Job's friends' debate with Job. Believe it or not, Buddhism says that's exactly right. That's exactly right. In fact, everything you'll ever suffer with came from a former life that you have no access to. The other answer is the non-believing answer, what's called a nihilistic or a nihilistic answer, a meaningless answer for those that are non-believers, and it's this. God would never act that way. He'd never, ever allow suffering if he's really a good God, so he's either cruel and not good or he doesn't exist. Job doesn't allow either one of those answers. The karmic answer, 
the pat answer, it must be connected to some, some sin in your life? It has to be. It can be. It doesn't have to be. Or the idea that God's either unjust, cruel, and not good, or non-existent altogether. As a matter of fact, many of us have a, a, a view of this sort of thing. Isn't it true that sometimes we say to ourselves, we hardly say it out loud, that when we can't get to a perpetrator of somebody going through something, we say, think something like this to ourselves, well, maybe it's the victim. I mean, we, we, we're not too far off of Job's friends, friends, he calls them miserable comforters. We're going to talk about them here in a second. But we do that. We think, I'm too wise and clever to ever have that stuff happen to me. I think too far ahead, and I'm too dedicated to God. It happens to all of us. I was in Israel. I had a really severe, <laughs> I can't say this publicly, growing injury. Uh, I said this out loud, obviously, uh, yes. I, it was pretty bad, and I'm thinking, I'm in Israel helping people understand God's word. Do I, I mean, I can't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have trouble walking? I thought, I, you, see, you see the transactional idea? Are you kidding me, Lord? Um, so none of us are too far from this sort of thing at all. You just think this couldn't happen to me. So um, it is true that the, from our perspective, this side of eternity, it looks like those that try to do the best don't always live the best. Those that try their hardest, still suffering still comes, hardship still comes, and God still uses it. So I wanted to bring you, uh, as a first quote, a very well-known uh, at least through the 20th century, a very well-known Jewish rabbi who decided to go beyond his study of the Torah and go into the, the wisdom literature in Job. His name's Rabbi Abraham Herschel. And Heschel said this, God is not nice. God is not an uncle. God's an earthquake. Partially true. And then he goes on to tell a number of his congregants in the synagogue about just how difficult Job is as a book. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here, again, before we get into, get into the actual book. Um, it's a little bit of a busy screen, but let me just, I'm going to hit a couple of these real quick. Most Christian scholars call Job a very difficult text. I can remember being in an uh, in office of a, the, the pastor of the church plant we were part of up in Georgia, and one of the things new Christians used to say is how confused sometimes they got with the Bible. Now, I immediately would raise an eyebrow and go, that sounds like you just don't read it. Um, but no, sometimes there are authentically difficult passages in the Bible, both linguistically and conceptually. Job is a bona fide difficult set of text, all 42 chapters. Not necessarily in the Hebrew. You can get the, the idea of what's going on pretty easily. But it's a, an extremely difficult text in a couple of ways. Here's the first way. One way is the idea that it doesn't give you full answers to things. And it almost leans into the fact that it's not a full answer. It's basically you're going to have to get over not having the full answer. That is one thing you can get straight out of the book of Job. You're just going to have to deal with it. Second, it's a half answer without the New Testament. So I always felt bad when I'm reading some of these guys that don't go beyond the Old Testament, some of these Jewish scholars that can't add Jesus to the Job theme. But you don't, you get a half answer, and the whole book of Job is a half answer to the biblical approach to suffering. And we'll get the full in the conclusion. Another thing I wanted to bring to your attention is this, and this is a, this, just hang with me, hang with me. If I get a little bit technical, but it's going to hang with me. This is a reason why some of the best and brightest Bible scholars call this a difficult text. For the rest of your life, if you continue going to church, God, God willing, if you continue going to church or go to a small group or read a book or hear any teacher or leader at all, online or off, anybody that's biblically authentic will split what they're doing into two sections. Any good leader that's staying biblically faithful. They'll split their section into interpretation, what Pastor, calls, Pastor Russ calls the what, and then, inter, and then application, the why. What's the text saying and why does it matter to me, right? Now, let me give you the difficulty of Job here, right? So we got to get the interpretation right. What did this mean when the author first wrote it and intended it to his audience? And then now let's bring it up millennia and see what it means to us in the 21st century, Another issue you have in the Bible is the Bible is broken up into two main categories of understanding. There are descriptions in the Bible telling you what happened, and then prescriptions telling you what you ought to do and emulate. Trouble, right? Paradigm example in David. All right, remember, remember David, a man after God's own heart. We're supposed to emulate that, right? We're supposed to emulate David in the fact that he had boldness and trusted God when he went against a bear and Goliath. 
We're supposed to love the way David had a heart after God and trusted God through adversity. We're, that's prescriptive. Do that. Follow that example. We're not supposed to do what he did to Uriah and have him killed. We're not supposed to do what he did with Bathsheba. Prescriptive, do this. Descriptive. Now Job. The majority of the body of Job's book is an argument between Job and three friends and one fourth friend that comes in, the cocky young Elihu. And here's the deal. They say true things. Prescriptive? We're supposed to believe these things, right? But then Job calls them miserable and God condemns them for what they did. Do you see the difficulty? Do we believe what the friend said and apply it or do we disregard it because God wasn't pleased with it? God has to be convinced not to judge them at the end. Job is an extraordinarily difficult book. There's other issues. Let me give you just one more. The two biggest threats to authentic Christianity in our walls, capital C Christianity, Christianity across the world, the two things that are the most, most common example of compromised leaders are, think, two Ps. A prosperity pastor or a progressive pastor. And both of them hate Job. Both types hate Job. The prosperity preacher can't even, doesn't have a place for Job. Hey, you getting saved means God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise all the time, all the time. No, no questions asked, period. No going any further. What about Job? I, what? I, who? Job what? Uh, I, uh, okay, is, uh, is that in the Bible? There are some famous prosperity preachers that don't call themselves prosperity preachers that are, that are uh, in, in working today that say things like this. Jesus is the answer and Job's the question. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, okay, that's not enough, right? The other is a progressive pastor. For a progressive, they will mess with the essentials of the faith just to get these small things off the table for their congregants. They don't want anything to do with sin, judgment, justice, righteousness, holiness, all the things that sand off our fallen nature and are the change agents, right? The bad news of what Jesus is the good news, the answer. So progressive pastors don't want that. They don't have any place for Job either. Those are the two biggest threats to authentic, traditional, God-fearing, God, walking with God Christianity in and outside of the doors of the church. And Job is anathema. Job is, let's not even talk about him. And that should be enough for us to look at him seriously tonight. Amen? That should be enough for us to look at him seriously. So we are. So um, let me give you this quote from Peter Kraft as well. I think you'll love Peter Kraft. Peter Kraft is a, uh, is a scholar, a biblical scholar that's now an emeritus professor at Boston College. Uh, I love this quote from Kraft because I want this for us tonight, right? Listen to Kraft here. Job's a mystery, a mystery that satisfies something in us, but not our reason. The rationalist is repelled by Job as Job's three rationalist friends were repelled by Job. But something deeper in us is satisfied by Job and is nourished. Is it? It puts iron in your blood. That's what I want for us tonight. I pray, Heavenly Father, that Job puts iron in our blood tonight. And again, it's important because none of us escape suffering and pat answers won't do and avoiding it won't do. It's in the word for a reason. Amen? So that's what we're going to go. So just so you know tonight, I've got, I'm going to try to make three moves. I'm going to cut Job's 42 chapters into three sections, and then we're going to do three quick applications. And uh, that way we can try to get, pull some, I, let me just say this, and I know Pastor Russ says this, almost everybody up here says this. Pastor Betzer used to say it. Go read the book for yourself. There's so many power verses in there. Uh, even true things some of his colleagues say are in there as well, but please go read it for yourself. So in Job 1 through 3, you get this backdrop that Job's not aware of. In fact, the whole gambit is based on Job not being aware of this background. You have this very mysterious council where Satan can approach God and ask permission for things. And we're not told anything about it. Okay, there it is, right? If you want a New Testament example of something like this, Jesus in Luke 22, you remember this? He tells Peter... You and the disciples have been asked by Satan, my father, I'm praying for you to be sifted like wheat. And then he predicts that Peter's going to turn, hey, and when you return, he's like, return from what? I'll go to death with you. He's like, when you return, lead my people. So you have this mysterious something going on where God says, have you considered my servant Job? And by the way, this could happen to any of us. It's not in there as a one-off. Job is an extreme example of suffering for sure. But if, we, if we're true to the Bible, we have to say this is at least possible today. 
And God said, if you consider my servant Job, another difficult part of it, it says God, it says some translations say perfect. We know he's not perfect, perfect. Maybe he was righteous at the time. If he's perfect, he's Jesus. If he's, he's not sinless or else he doesn't need a cross and he could have gone to the cross for us, minus the miracles. So he says he's blameless, perfected, right? Or perfect. In other words, maybe acting perfect, didn't have a lot of habitual sin in his life, sought God at this point in his life. And Satan says, yeah, right. Give me a break. He loves you only for the blessings you give him, and that's it. You take those away, he'll curse you to your face. Full stop right here. This is something for all of us right now. Isn't it hard to know whether we love God for his benefits or for him? Isn't that hard sometimes? I mean, there's even songs about confusing the blessing with the blesser, right? How can we move from a mercenary love of God to something authentic and real? Here's the answer. The only way you can know that are things that you love are taken away from you. It doesn't mean it's inauthentic if you haven't suffered. But why do you get a certain depth after you have suffered and been faithful through it? Because now it is very clear you're not loving God for the benefits. We want to move away from a mercenary love of God and be a real servant of God. And by the way, this is not some weird supernatural. I mean, yes, the counsel and Satan's dialogue with God is, is hard to understand. But isn't this true in our own relationships? If somebody's only with you because you're providing benefits to them, and then the minute things get hard, they're out, do you wonder if they ever loved you? You should. That's the situation we're looking at with God as well. I believe the reason God allowed this to happen is that he knew that Job loved him. He knew it. But he knew Job needed to come to a new level of greatness. He needed Job, that love needed to be refined. And so you get this. And we look into round one, round one. And I want to be clear too that one of the things you get from chapters one through three is that Job does pretty well in the first round. It would have broken me. I don't know how I would have responded. Um, You have marauding Sabaeans and Chaldeans come in. Uh, They first take his livestock. That's your wealth in the ancient world. Then they take his agriculture And then a messenger comes and says, your kids were all celebrating or meeting in a structure and a storm came up and the structure collapsed and all your kids are dead. He rips his clothes, he mourns, and then he says these powerful words, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I'll praise the name of the Lord. Whew. I hope you feel the weight of that. But one of the things Job's saying right here is God's God and I'm not. God's God and I'm not. Um, I wanted you to listen to this quote from one of the best commentators, one of the best Bible scholars on the book of Job out there, the most respected. His name's Francis Anderson. Listen to this quote. Here, if we've, we, if we've rightly found the heart of the theology of the whole book, it's a very great depth. So here, Francis Anderson's saying, we've got a pretty big theme right here before we get out of chapter three. Hey, there's 39 chapters left. All right, what's Anderson talking about? There's a rebuke in it for any person by complaining about particular events in his or her life implies that he or she could propose to God better ways of running the universe than God currently uses. Men are eager to use force to combat evil, and in their impatience, they wish God would do the same more often. By such destructive acts, men do and become evil. If Job were to do what is described in chapter 40, verses 8 through 14, he would not only usurp the role of God, he would become another Satan. Only God can destroy creatively Only God can transmute evil into good. Probably a person that says it even better than Anderson (laughs) and lived it out better than probably I ever will is Elizabeth Elliott. You guys know Elizabeth Elliott, uh, missionary to Ecuador. Husband gets speared to death with four other missionaries, and she goes back to these Indians and ministers to them. Again, and does that through her life, loses a second husband as well. Listen to what Elliot had to say right near the time where the Indians allowed her to come back in and they gave her a voice in among them. The deepest things I've learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters and hottest fires have come the deepest things I know about God. When she got to the end of her life, she did a small teaching on the final chapter of Job, chapter 42, and listen to what she said about this, amazing. God is God. If he's God, he's worthy of my worship and my service. I will find rest nowhere but in his will. And that will, God's will, is infinitely, immeasurably, unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he might be up to. God's God, she's not. God's God, Job's not. Round one, Job does well. 
right? He's appreciative, God gives. He's deferential, God takes away. I will praise the name of the Lord. Satan then challenges further. And he says, okay, what's the most ultimate thing to your, <laughs> your human vermin? Their health. You take his health, he'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, but not his life. Now, again, our contemporary society has a giant issue with this. How could God do this? How, how in the world? And you know, part of this is because, because of technology and our ability to manipulate matter to do what we want to do, we don't treat God like he's God. We really don't. I've met so many people on campuses and off that think, I've got a better plan. I can do better than God. Absolutely. He needs to listen to me for a little bit. In fact, some people's prayers sound like that. So Satan gets to afflict Job, and I was actually going to get sackcloth, get down to literally uh, 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 a crisscross applesauce and show you pottery shards. His skin condition so bad to relieve pressure, he's popping his skin open, uh, and it it, it undoes him. Uh, In fact, his wife says, go ahead and curse God and die. It's not normally what a scripture text you use in marital counseling, but uh, we don't hear much from her. Again, in the, uh, in the dialogue, but uh, Job doesn't do that. He absolutely doesn't do that. Uh, that's his wife's counsel in 2.9. Um, so uh, then you get the body of the whole book. 3 through 38 is just a debate between Job and his three friends, who seems like the only wise thing they do is not talk for the first week. They're just present. Great lesson there. Just present, right? And then their arguments come down to this. Job, is God good? Yes, he is. Is God just? Yes, he is. Is God true? Yes, he is. And what does that say about your situation? And so the friends go back and forth. And Job says, well, yes, I agree with all those, but I don't think he's quite fair right here with me. And what Job's friends are endeavoring to do over and over and over again is convince Job that he's done something wrong. He's either got a sin or a set of sins that if he just apologized to God for these things, everything would be okay. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Not winning baby name awards. Even today, you know, I'm weird the baby names are. Anyway, so far, Bildad and Eliphaz. Yeah, Eliphaz. So they keep going back and forth and back and forth, and it gets more and more intense. And Job keeps saying, sorry. He says at one point, he says, you know, as the sparks fly up from a flame, so is man prone to wickedness. True. Um, but I still think something's off here. I'm trying to seek God's face, but he's hiding from me. And they're like, repent. He's like, of what? Like, they even get to a point where they say, maybe you've forgotten. Can you just say sorry to God for something you've forgotten? And Job says, that doesn't make any sense. How do I repent for something I don't remember? Even Christian theologians have what they call sins of omission. I missed it, and I should have done that. In commission, I intended to do the wrong thing. And Job's saying, I I don't even know what set of sins is taught. I can't identify it, so it's inauthentic for me to apologize. But Job starts getting really extreme. He swings wildly between different positions on this sort of thing while he's trying to interact with these guys and convince them, I'm telling you, I don't think it has anything to do with what I'm going through. And the crazy part is, guys, they say true things. They say things like God is just. He says you can't really know the counsels of God. It's, it's a lot of times his will's inscrutable to us. We won't know on this side of heaven. We know that God rewards the just, and we know that he punishes the unjust. Job agrees with all of it, but he's like, I still don't think you're right about my situation. And they see this as just being recalcitrant and rebellious. So Job swings between extremes. Here's one extreme. Though he slay me, yet I will praise him. I will trust him. And then he's over here, and he says, if I just had a lawyer to get these words right, y'all get off my back, and God, maybe he'd show up. It's pretty bad if you're asking for a lawyer. If Steve Hartzell's in here, you know, it's, I had to do a lawyer joke. But lawyer, God, just listen up. Maybe he's, I don't know, maybe he's, you know, busy with something. And over here, you know, though he slay me, though he ruin me, I will praise his name. So Job's friends over and over again try to get him to do this. There are sins that you have not recognized or do recognize that you will not repent of and then the suffering will stop. The last friend, Elihu, gets called in at the end or comes in at the end. He's a cocky, young, arrogant man. And he at least says this, you guys aren't very persuasive. That's what he says to Job's friends, Zophar, Bildad, and Eliphaz. And then he says this, Job, regardless of what you're saying, your whole line of questioning is putting you in the driver's seat over God. And Job disagrees with him as well. So I wanted to stop here and just do a little mini application because there's so much of the book that's the debate. And it's this, don't be a miserable comforter. Don't be a miserable comforter. One of the areas of uh, study I had to do in my graduate studies, I wanted to do what's the thing that really 
is the most difficult question for committed Christians. It's the problem of evil. They call it the POE, problem of evil. As an acro- we're addicted to acronyms today. But I studied that in my grad program, and one of the guys you had to read if you were going to do a concentration on problem of evil and suffering, evil's the abstract, right? Suffering's the what happens, the result, is you have to read John Feinberg. John Feinberg is a Christian. He got his PhD doing an analysis of what the Bible says about suffering and then offering it in a PhD dissertation defense at the University of Chicago, a secular institution that's at least equal to Ivy Leagues, brilliant people, at least through the 20th century. University of Chicago was highly, highly, highly respected. And John goes in there with non-believers and defends his dissertation. So this guy was a master at the biblical approach to suffering. And then he said something hit him like a truck about four years into his seminary teaching career. And I wanted to read to you what that was. His wife gets diagnosed with a disease called Huntington's Chorea, a progressive neurogenitive disorder that leads not only to the loss of all voluntary bodily movement, but to memory loss, depression, and various forms of dementia, including hallucinations and paranoia. His, it starts showing up in your early 30s, and it showed up in his wife in the early 30s. The bonus on top was this. You also get a 50-50 chance, since it's genetic, that your kids will have it, and it won't show up till 30. He said, in one fell stroke, we learned that my whole family is under a cloud of doom. Now, before this point, John Feinberg got frustrated with people in his church that were going through suffering. He's like, don't they read their word? There's all sorts of resources in the word. I've memorized most of them. Now he says, I have this weird thing going on in my life. I know the answers, but I'm... I feel like I've been let down by God. I feel like he's betrayed me. Uh, Listen to this. Who was I, the creature, to contest the creator? As Paul says in Romans 9, the creature has no right to haul the creator into the courtroom of human moral judgments and put him on trial as though he's done something wrong. God has total power and authority over me. True statement. I felt God somehow misled me, even tricked me. Notice there's not a nevertheless or yet. Feinberg was familiar with all the biblical responses and it said it took him months to even get back to teaching right? And he said, I had miserable comforters. They were well-intentioned church folk. They were well-intentioned people, but they just didn't, they were saying true things. Some things I already knew and written my dissertation on and defended in front of pagans. And it just wasn't getting it done. Listen to, uh, this is uh, one of his colleagues that's also, that also teaches uh, in Chicago, Don Carson, maybe in my opinion, one of the best New Testament scholars in the world living right now. There's a way of using theology and theological arguments that wounds rather than heals. This is not the fault of the theology and the theological arguments. It's the fault of the miserable comforter who fastens on an inappropriate fragment of truth, whose timing is off, whose attitude is condescending, or whose application is insensitive, or whose true theology is couched in culture-laden cliches that they grate rather than comfort. That's what he said happened to him. And Carson also said this. It's one thing to know Remember what I said, from head to heart? It's one thing to know the answer. It's another thing to trust God. And what does it take? Something like this. He said there were people that say things like this. Hey, everybody's going to die. John, at least you know when and where your wife's going to likely die. He's like, who'd want to know that? That's a true statement, but is that comforting? Is that from the Lord? He had other people say, well, I, you know, I, I mean, it's God's sovereign. Yes, <laughs> I agree. But all he heard through all that is you don't have a right to lament. You don't have a right to cry out. And that goes against Job, the Psalms. We have an entire book in our holy book called Cryings, Lamentations. He didn't have time to process any of that, honestly. What he heard through all these good-intentioned interactions was this. You're not a very mature Christian if you're not already experiencing peace and goodness and joy and happiness which is unfair, isn't it? Probably one of my most difficult counseling scenarios ever happened right on the back end. We just had reopened from COVID. It was right back, center right for you guys, center left for me. Right back there, I was on call. Gentleman called and asked if I, he could meet me for, I can meet him for prayer in the sanctuary. He'll remain unnamed. We sat right back there and he laid out for me one of the worst situations I've ever heard. His wife had died a year before. He said, I uh, just got robbed and uh, vandalized my apartment. Um, I uh, also got a letter the day after the vandalization that they were going to up the, the rent by $500 and if you don't like it we got a line of people waiting to replace you so it wiped out five years of being a faithful tenant 
He said, I've got a son who's outed himself. He's a very public celebrity homosexual. He has called every member of my family, and I've been disinvited to every social event simply because I said he couldn't spend the night with his boyfriend in my apartment. I'll go meet him other places, but I'm not going to. That's not happening in my apartment. And on top of all this, it's not uh, terminal, but I've got cancer. Got a diagnosis yesterday. And the guy just broke down. You know, guys, I, I know part of the beginning of that is you're just there. I kept telling him how sorry I was this happened. Any good minister wants to be practical help. Any good minister worth their salt. And I said, safest thing, well, let's just go to the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And that's the first thing we prayed. First thing we prayed, right? Blessed are the brokenhearted. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, right? They will be comforted. Blessed are those, this is the one we all hate, but it's doubled down. It's doubled by Jesus here. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then we prayed some lament psalms. And then we asked for God's power to help him forgive who needed to be forgiven and to heal him. And we stayed in touch for about the next couple of weeks. I would just text him, just let him know, hey, I'm here. You can come back in anytime you want. And light began to come through little by little. I kept saying, well, you know, this too will pass. But I'm telling you, it was, it was devastating, absolutely devastating. So don't be Job's friends. Don't be miserable comforters because God says they said true things, but I don't like the way they applied them. And that's the answer. Sometimes you can say something true and it be misapplied so much so that God ju- will judge it. It's like Carson said, let's not be people that say truths but apply them poorly. <clears throat> I wanted to read you this uh, quote from John Newton on this subject as well, because, you know, remember, Jesus is called the suffering servant, right, in Isaiah. It also says something very, very interesting. A bruised reed won't break. That's not just bruised like a simple bruise. I got a contusion. It's a death blow. It's a deep contusion, internal injury, internal bleeding. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he won't snuff out. And in one of the best sermons ever by John Newton, the former slaver, said this, "Though (laughs) though dark be my way, since he is my guide, tis mine to obey, tis his to provide. By prayer let me wrestle, and he will perform. With Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm. Great, great, great way to, to close. I, I wish I had a little bit of John Newton's uh, Holy Spirit power, right? Um, but that's the idea. Job never sees it all, right? Job never sees everything. He has to walk by faith. So with that I'm going to move to the last section where God shows up and God says, okay, I'm going to talk with you now. 38 through 42, God does this very thing. And I've heard probably about five sermons, you guys, and and well-intentioned pastors. These aren't progressive or prosperity pastors that think the end of Job means this. Shut your mouth. Sit there, boy, while I trash talk. I don't think that's what God's doing. Even though he asked Job 64 questions back to back, things like this. Where were you? Do you know how to make a hippopotamus? You know how to construct a cell? Have you ever seen anybody throw a constellation like Orion into the sky? Where were you? Now, I don't think that's divine trash talk. He does say, stand and listen and answer me. But I think what God is saying, it looks like he's saying is something like this. 64 questions. Job, you don't even understand the blessings that I give you. You don't fully comprehend them, but you enjoy them. You trust me because that's the easy side. Are you going to trust me with the suffering? That's something for all of us. I'm going to use this verb intentionally. Has God entrusted you with suffering today and trusted you with it? What are you going to do with it? He's probably refining you. That's where the trust comes in. The main point of the book of Job is you got to trust me. You can ask questions, you can lament, but trust me, you move through to hope and trust. Can it be possible that God is utilizing the suffering to do something greater in you that I'm just going to say it. That couldn't be gotten any other way. That's another point of the book of Job. So he says, look, 64 questions, not trash talk. You don't even understand the blessings I give you. Will you just trust me with the suffering? Trust me. And we see Job respond in this way. He says, I repent, but it can't be I'm repenting for the sins I didn't remember when all these other guys were. That would defeat the whole book of Job. God would have nothing to be angry at his friends about. He's, a better word there, retract, I retract my line of questioning that didn't trust you. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make sure I go back to saying God is God and I'm not. God is God and God is God alone. And I do trust you, God, because I don't understand even the blessings. I don't understand the children that are my wealth, the livestock that are my wealth, the agriculture that's my wealth. I don't get it. 
And as we conclude here, I wanted to bring you just three quick reflections, really, really quick, 806. First is this, probably one of the most respected sociologists, and I'm not sure if he's a Christian or not. He, I have a suspicion he might be. I don't have a lot of, I'm not going to say that. Um, I, so, uh, he's a great sociologist from the 20th century. Great sociologist. His name's Peter Berger. Peter Berger wrote a number of books. He was the guy every sociology class wanted to have as a visiting guy, did more research on people groups than anybody in the 20th century, had more research grants, published more books, had more bestsellers. This guy was an expert in every sense of the word for the academic world. He wrote a book called The Sacred Canopy. And in that book, he said, look, human cultures constantly try to show people how to live well through suffering. Some don't do it very well. Some do it really well. And he said, look, it's hard to beat the biblical approach. And he said, look, here's the strong logic of the Old Testament crystallized in Job. That's what Berger says. I'm not sure he's a believer. Here's the strong logic, the kind of hard truth of Job. Quit asking questions. Trust me, I'm God, and you wouldn't understand if I showed you anyway. That's Berger, right? He's like, there it is. He says, but listen to this. You're going to love this one, right? So this is Berger. The unbearable tension of this problem brought about by the Old Testament is met with the essential Christian solution. Remember I told you Job's a half, it's half the truth? The essential Christian solution to the problem of suffering is this. The incarnate God is a God who suffers. Without this suffering, without the agony of the cross, the incarnation would not provide that solution of the problem of suffering to which we would contend, him and his authors, it owes its immense potence, potency. It's immense potency. Is there a more potent answer, even though it's not a full answer to the problem of evil? One side, treat me as God, trust me, quit asking questions. You couldn't understand it if I gave it to you. Oh, by the way, it isn't just power and it isn't just omniscience. I love you. I will voluntarily suffer and make myself vulnerable to people like you to reconnect with you. There was a minister named John Dixon who was coming, itinerating out of the mission field and was doing campus ministry, joined up with a campus ministry team and started doing evangelism on campus. And during one of the times where he was taking questions, a Muslim got up and said, are you kidding me about this God who suffers? It's ridiculous. And to a Muslim mind, it is ridiculous. He goes, not even a Muslim mind to any mind. Listen to what the guy said. How preposterous was the claim that a creator of the universe would be subjected to the forces of his own creation? That he'd have to eat and sleep, let alone die on a cross. That the cause of all causes could have pain inflicted on him by lesser beings. And Dixon did not have a quick answer to him. He's like, I, nothing came to mind. I just, there are quick answers to that. But you know what he did? He said, thank you for showing how unique Christianity is. We serve a God who has wounds, and the wounds are for us. Is there a greater compliment? Is there a higher place to put your identity? The God we serve thought you were as important enough to make himself vulnerable to his creations. Edward Shiletto was a minor poet during the teens, the 19 teens around World War I. He did a lot of bad poems. I gave him a shot. He really some bad poetry. But he had one that was a gem. And I was told by a friend of mine to check him out. So I want to give you probably his best poem, Jesus of the Scars out of John 20. Listen to this. This is Jesus' resurrection appearance to the disciples. If when the doors are shut, thou draw nears, only reveal those hands and that side of thine. We know today what wounds are. Never fear. Show us thy scars. We know the counterside, our own. The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. They rode, thou did stumble to thy throne. And to our wounds, only God, God's wounds can speak. And to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. So when you look at the cross, what you can say during suffering is what you know isn't the case. It isn't that God doesn't care. It isn't that he, isn't, he doesn't understand. Remember in Acts 9 when Jesus tells Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus has long been gone. How is he identifying with suffering like that? So Berger's right. One half, two half, they come together in the person and work of Jesus Christ. A very great gift indeed, right? The results of suffering, right? is sometimes suffering can be a great gift. There's some things that you'll need to achieve through suffering that can't be gotten any other way. So remember this too, that Job would be read by millions, if not billions of people after his time for millennia. That would, that would help give sufferers sustenance and strength. I don't know if that's success to you, but it is to me. People are always wondering about if their legacy will last on, that sort of thing. That's, this sort of approach brought a greatness to Job that 
wouldn't have happened otherwise. The last thing uh, to remember, and uh, I'm going to call uh, Nick and Julie up here as we finish out. Um, Job prayed the whole time. The big issue with suffering is this. Will I trust God through it or will I, it will drive me further from him because I don't like what he's doing. Job gave his doubts to God, complained to God, prayed to God, praised God, and did all the above, but he did it to God. So suffering didn't drive him away from God. It drove him toward God. Please, if you don't, anything else you don't get, that's, that's a big, big, big get for Job. And, and look at this. All throughout the Bible, the Bible says God's near to the brokenhearted. When we talked about that in the Beatitudes, Psalm 34, 18. He upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. Psalm 145, 14. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me, Jesus, as I identify with suffering? God is near and cares about all sufferers. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you and never forsake you. Ever. Before they sing this prayer, I want to just leave you with this. And I'm going to make sure I get it right. God allows evil to the degree it defeats itself. God allows, he has decided to map into the human history evil just to the degree that it will not achieve its ends. And that's the trust. Again, it angers and confuses us that God uses suffering at all, but he uses it only to the degree that it does not get what it wants. It does not get it the end it's supposed to achieve. And that's the idea. Job serves and worships God for him alone. He looks forward to his Savior. He asks, my Redeemer will live at some point. I, I can't wait. I need a Redeemer. Even after when he says that sort of thing. And this is where we get the powerful, powerful, powerful word from the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. Listen, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, famine or nakedness, peril or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors. In the suffering, we're more than conquerors. In the suffering, through whom? Through him who loved us, Jesus this is right out of Job 13. The song is called, Though You Slay Me, Yet I Will Praise You. Please think about it. If you know it, you can sing it. Let's hear this prayer set to music and reflect on what God's trying to do in our lives about trusting him through suffering, adversity, and hardship. Broken, the one who's torn me apart. You struck down to bind me up. You say you do it all in love. That I might know you in your suffering. And though you slay me, yet I praise you though you take from me I will bless your name though you Flesh may fail, the earth below give way. With my eyes, with my eyes, I'll see the Lord. Lifted high upon that day, behold the Lamb that was slain. And I know every tear was worth it all.
one last time. Though you Sing a song to the one